what Apple used to be. The 1999 Power Mac G4 at the time was a high performance computer for graphic designers like myself, loaded with a powerful CPU and graphic processor. It was the slick design of the case that led me to my first Hackintosh project. I wanted to keep its looks as original as possible. A brilliant design with a graphite curved acrylic case and an easy to open access panel that allowed an owner to upgrade its core components. Indeed, throughout the 2000s, I replaced the central processing unit, hard drives, and RAM for faster speeds. After researching all the hardware needed to build my new powerhouse Mac, I began to disassemble the dusty components of this old box. Even for back in the day, the CPU had dual cooling fans. An interesting fact about this computer, it was truly a global built marvel with parts coming from all over the world, most branded with the Apple Computer Inc. name. An internal lithium battery made in Israel, PCI cards made in Hong Kong, and various other parts from China and elsewhere. I painstakingly photographed and labeled each part as I removed them, mostly to learn how all the parts were connected so when I did my build, I would have a good idea where things fit, or in some cases, didn't fit. And at the end of the day, a computer boils down to a hard drive, RAM, CPU, motherboard, a GPU, power supply, and a system fan. Just for fun, I connected back all the components outside of the case just to see if they would run. Oops, no operating system. Then lastly, cleaning up the case. It had collected quite a bit of dust over the years. I purchased almost all my parts from Amazon, which truly had the best prices. And I'm a Prime member, so I get free shipping, which helps save a lot of money. As the parts arrived over the course of several weeks, I started doing some rough placement to see how everything would fit. The liquid CPU cooler, the Gigabyte motherboard, the power supply and drives, and other items. It wasn't long before I realized my dream of having a water-cooled system was not happening. I could not find one with hoses long enough to go around the huge graphics card, and going over wasn't an option as the door wouldn't close. So I ended up installing two internal system fans instead. Now it was time to modify the case to ensure all the components would fit. There was a bit of sawing, hacking, and cutting to be done. The plastic back panel had to be carefully pried away and cut. This was my first time using a Dremel tool, so I went through a lot of blades. Double checking the position for all the motherboard external connectors, I then created a new back panel. I also painted it silver to match everything else, so it would look more like the original. Because of the new graphic card size, I had to trim the original DVD zip drive brackets so the case door would close. Next I cut two new holes for the dual system fans air intake, and little slots in the bottom where I originally planned for the liquid cooler fan to be, for some additional airflow. I also had to drill holes for the new motherboard standoffs, then cleaned and smoothed out all the rough edges so I have a nice new shiny case to install all my parts. I installed the power supply first since it was heavy and didn't want to risk dropping it on other parts. Then I installed the dual system fans, it would be hard to get to those later. As well, the solid state drive and additional hard drives for storage. 
For the motherboard standoffs, I started out using regular metal nuts and bolts, but then I became paranoid I would have an electrical short, so I purchased some nice brass ones and added rubber washers for additional cushion and support. Next, popping in the CPU was a breeze. RAM compared to old school looks rather high tech these days. Then I started connecting all the power supply cables and SATA cables. The original front panel card, which controls the power reset button and LED, was challenging. I researched how others approached this, and it involved a lot of splicing of wires and soldering, but I came up with a cleaner solution by purchasing strips of single pin connectors and matching them to their corresponding connectors on the motherboard which worked perfect. Another item I opted for was a front panel high definition audio and USB port. Since I couldn't make room for the optical DVD drive, which I may add later, but the place where the old zip drive used to be was a perfect fit and has proved very functional. After many inspections, I did some final cable management, tucking them in here and there to ensure the door would easily open and shut without crimping or damaging any wiring, and of course, tested this out all along the way. Booting up the first time, this was exciting to see everything finally running and the glow from the motherboard and LED system fans looked great. And I thought all the previous work was the hardest, but thanks to a great user forum called TonyMac86 and a wealth of helpful contributors, it finally all came together. But there was a lot of reading and steps involved, and me having zero patience for these things, this was my biggest challenge so far. First, creating a USB thumb drive for Unibeast, the software that enables the magic of Hackintosh, then software called MultiBeast, and finally one called Clover, which becomes your boot screen. A few steps involve some specific BIOS settings, which are always fun. The welcome screen was a thrill to finally see, because this was first and foremost a Hackintosh, meaning a Mac OS that runs on what is basically PC hardware. The installation part was easy, but getting the magic of Mac OS to work with non-Apple hardware was not. I installed OS X El Capitan first, then later successfully updated to Mac OS Sierra. The drivers for both the HD audio and graphics card took the longest to get working. I really liked the way the system fans with the LED lights glowed behind the Apple logo outside the case. Because this was a dual boot system, I installed two solid state drives at 250 gigabytes each just for the operating systems, and two hard drives for data storage, a two terabyte for the Mac and one terabyte for Windows. I installed Windows 10 mostly to run my game World of Warcraft and for beta testing AI and UI products. <laughs> something every good geek would do to see how well the system they built performs. I used a really cool tool that uses 3D gaming graphics to analyze how well your system performs, what the speed and frame rates per second are. Overall, both my tests under the Mac OS and the Windows for the system I had built performed extremely well. <laughs> There were a lot of lessons learned, but at the end of the day, I created something that you can't get on the market, with specs that easily compare with the top-end Mac Pro computers, and at a fraction of the cost. Apple's cost between three to four thousand dollars. My cost about fifteen hundred dollars for basically two computers, Mac and Windows, in one box. I enjoyed this experience so much. My next project is to hack my retro Apple G4 Cube. Wish me luck! <laughs>